Did you know that the average programmer spends over 10 hours reading code for every one hour they spend actually coding? Before we begin, I want to thank you for clicking on this video. It shows you care about your craft. Good programmers use coding standards. I started coding when I was 14 years old and later in life I had my own software development company where I hired and managed 40 programmers and I can tell you it's crucial when you have multiple programmers working on a project that everybody follows the same coding standards. Even if you're a lone wolf coding for yourself, it really helps to have coding standards so that when you come back to the code in six months or a year to do enhancements and modifications, you can read it and make the code changes so much quicker. So let's look at my company's coding standards. One of my favorite quotes is by John Woods. Always code as if you know the person maintaining your code is a violent psychopath who knows where you live. The primary goals of having good coding standards is readability, text searching, consistency, and reusability. Because if you have good code standards, you'll be able to read the code much easier and comprehend it and understand it faster. You'll be able to do text searches to find the specific code you're looking for faster. And then with the consistency, you won't have to wonder about, should I use yes and no, or Y and N, and that allows for better reusability of your code. So if you think about the average code or spending 10 hours reading code and one hour of actual coding, if you have good coding standards, one of the goals is to reduce that amount of time to maybe four hours of reading code and four hours of actually being productive coding per day. Can you imagine if your boss said, hey, you have to work 11 hours a day because I want you to do one hour of coding. And you could say, wait a second, I have a methodology using coding standards that will allow me to work eight hours a day instead of 11 and be four times more productive than the other programmers because I'm using coding standards. Knowing your case types and being consistent in their use can greatly help to both readability and text searching. It doesn't matter which case type you use with which language, as long as you're consistent. For example, PHP constants, we usually use all uppercase. And over here you see in my PHP example, I have camel case for function names and for variable names. For CSS, you usually use kebab case. Kebab case is all lowercase words with a dash in between them. For HTML, for this demo, I used word caps for the IDs. And for the JavaScript example, I'm using snake case, which is all lowercase again, but with underscores in between each word. You can see it's very readable and great for text searching. All uppercase is often also used for reserved words in SQL, like select, from, where, order by, Speaking of reserved words, don't use them for your table names or your column names or your variable names because that makes your life so much more difficult. For example, I inherited somebody else's database and they chose to abbreviate longitude as long. Well, that is a reserved word in MySQL. So then anytime that you do a select ID comma long comma whatever, it would crash because it didn't recognize long as a column name so you'd have to put back ticks around it. Just don't use reserved words for your column names or variable names. For one thing, it makes it harder to text search for them. Be descriptive. Wonderful quote by Robert C. Martin. A long descriptive name is better than a short enigmatic name. A long descriptive name is better than a long descriptive comment. A name is a horrible variable name. Never use name for a variable name. Never use type for a variable name. Use client name, client type. That way you can do a search for it and you'll find the client name instead of finding the username or the staff name because your username should be named username and your staff name should be named staff name. I recommend adding scope to your variable name. You should put a lot of time into defining your variable names. 
so that later on when you're searching for it, if you see the variable name, you will immediately know, is this a functional scope, global scope, or page scope? By page scope, I mean if you're doing something like PHP where you could have include files, then the variable could be defined and only used on that page, or it could be defined globally and then used on multiple pages. So it's nice to know, is this a global variable or a page variable or a function only variable? So you might want to include that in the actual variable name. Temporary variables are the exception. You're never going to do a text search to try to find a temporary variable or a variable that's only used in a for loop. So you don't need to worry about making nice for loop variable names. Page and file naming. If you're using um, anything that involves pages or DLLs or whatnot, be consistent. Don't have one DLL be named with a capital letter as the first letter and the next one be all lowercase. The bottom line is readability and being consistent and being able to text search. It's much, much more efficient if your text search is case sensitive and that's why it's very important to have case sensitive variable names and page names. Capitalizing SQL special words like select, from, where, order by, group by. It's a industry standard. Capitalize those so that you can easily see them when you're looking over your SQL code and tell them apart from the column names and table names. Here's some sample naming standards. Uh, page name and variable names as camel case, rest calls. If you have a set of functions that you are using to do rest calls, you might want to make those blatantly obvious by just naming the functions appropriately such as have all your rest functions start with the word rest in lowercase and then with the action whether that be a get a post uh, a put and then the descriptor such as this is the note list this is the user list robert martin again you should name a variable using the same care with which you name a firstborn child truth Comments, good and bad. As Michael Papa said, comments are often lies waiting to happen. Code should speak for itself whenever possible. What he means by that is, if you write a comment and then six months from now, somebody changes the code, well, the comment, if it's not updated, when the code is updated, now the comment could be lying about what that code is doing. So it's better not to have comments if you could just make your code descriptive enough by having good variable names and function names. Developer consistency. When I hire a new developer, I always tell them, pick your three character initials and we will use that forever for your commenting methodology. And if your three character initials are something that is too common in the code base, pick a different three character initials. They don't have to be your actual initials. That way we can say, oops, there's an issue. We want to do a search on this developer. And if they, ha and we require a standardized date format, pick whichever date format works for your company. The one that we chose was month, month, slash DD, slash YY. And we do a space between the initials and the first part of the date, and then a space after the date. And then there's a the comment. That way, it's very easy, since we're consistent, to find comments in the code. I highly recommend that you invest the time to set up your text editor so that you can make comments in the right format with just a quick click of a button. All good text editors have macros or snippets or some other way to make it so that you can do this. For example, I'm using Atom here, and I do one click of three buttons and it pops up my initials and the date format using today's date. If I want to do a comment block, I do CO and tab, and there it is. And then I can say chart logic or whatever this code block is going to be. It's a short term investment that will save you hundreds of hours in the future. Take the time, set up your macros now. If you have any questions, please add them in the comments below. Change requests. Sometimes you have a client that says they really want a change that you just know they're going to revert within a week, a month, or six months. 
In which case, what I recommend is you put into the actual code in the comment, this was requested by John Doe, check the email chain dated such and such, and then you do the coding. That way, when in six months they say, why the heck was this done? You can say, oh, here's the email chain. It was John Doe who said this was to be done this way. Oh, by the way, one of my favorites, I work with a guy named Gary O'Donnell. And I'll tell you, when you saw comments from G-O-D, those comments seemed really important. Comment blocks. If you're doing a section of code that is rather complicated, you might want to just put a comment block on it with or without your initials and the date. But it can be sometimes very handy to know when a piece of code starts and where it finishes when it's doing a very specific piece of functionality. Text searching. One of the primary reasons it takes so long to do a code change when you're doing a modification or enhancement or tracking down a bug in a system that has thousands of pages and maybe hundreds of thousands of lines of code is you have to find the code that has the problem first. Especially if you didn't write the code and maybe you're new with the company. So you're doing text searching all the time. It helps if you can do a case sensitive text search and uh, if there's a good naming convention regarding the variable names, that will help tremendously. Syntax standardization. Several languages have multiple types of syntax for the exact same functionality. Like in PHP, you can do an if else statement with curly brackets or with the end if notation. In which case, it might seem fine, let's just use the curly brackets because this is a short one, but Oftentimes, over the course of a year, they end up adding more and more functionality within that if statement, in which case you end up with the bottom section not being able to see the top section when you're looking at it in your text editor, in which case if all you see is an in curly bracket, you don't know if it's an end if, in switch, in for, uh, for each loop. So I recommend you just go with the most concise obvious readable syntax possible that and if you make it consistent we always use this syntax then when you want to copy and paste that code to another section of the program you can without having to worry oh is the end syntax on this one different because i'm only copying the top half you know the syntax is the same throughout the code readability alignment and end of statements I really didn't think this was necessary, but I've seen some really bad code in the past. So I had to tell some of my programmers that did not last long in my company about aligning your end of statements with the beginning statement. And look here, if your if statement is on this line, then your else should start at the exact same spot and your end if should all align with where the if statement was then you should have indentation. Your indentation should be the same consistently for every level that you're indenting. And choose as a company, are we going with three spaces? Are we going with four spaces for an indent? Are we going with a tab? And is that tab defined as three spaces or four spaces or whatever? Define what you want your indentation to be. Make it a company standard. Set up your text editor so that it does that as your default and then stick with it for life. That way when you're copying and pasting code from one area to another, you don't have to worry about the indentation being off because it didn't match from one page to the next. Code indentation. For the love of God, just indent your code properly. Spacing. Spacing, so use these liberal. Uh, there was a time when people had to worry, oh, I gotta get this to fit on a little tiny floppy disk and Therefore, we'll have short variable names. We're gonna have as few spaces as possible. Guess what? Hard drive space is cheap now. We don't have to worry about that anymore. Use spaces liberally, have long variable names, have it be readable, have it be something that you can easily see, have the equal signs line up when you have a set of values being assigned to a set of variables. Uh, make it look good so even at 2 a.m. in the morning when you're looking at it with blurry eyes and you have to get this out, it still makes sense and it's readable. 
examples of a horrible SQL table and column names. When I started working for a company, I inherited a bunch of bad code and a bunch of bad SQL tables. This one was particularly horrible. Somebody more than five years before I got there created this table named XML and the columns were ID, WO, XML, and type. Every single column name is so common that if you do a text search, they had 731 PHP pages. XML was found 3,677 times in 155 tables. WO was found almost 16,000 times in 536 tables. That's more than two-thirds of the files in their website. Type was even worse, almost 6,900 and 443 files. No developer wants to say, okay, we're going to get this table naming, the table name and the columns named correctly, and then go through and update all these different files. So they now have over 2.3 million rows of data, and it is very difficult to find if there's ever a problem in their website. Just to get the point across, this is what a function looks like with no extra spacing, bad indentation. I generally used one space indentation and poor variable names. If there was a client emergency and they called you at 2 a.m. in the morning and they said, I have a sales demo in three hours, you have to get this fixed. Somebody broke the website. They uploaded files last night and I have a big sales demo that could double the, the money for the company. Can you get this fixed within the next three or four hours? By the way, the client is in a different time zone, three hour time zone difference. So he wants it done by 9 a.m. his time for the demo, which gives you three hours to do it between 2 a.m. and 5 a.m. so that he has one hour to prepare before he gives the demo at 6 a.m. your time. This actually happened to me once. If the code is unreadable readable, when you got blurry eyes and only three hours of sleep, you are going to be in a world of hurt. Fortunately, the code was much better. It was cleaner. Um, and by the way, this actually happened to me. The programmer didn't follow our proper standards with version control, so I couldn't just revert the code. We ended up firing that guy. Use good indentation. Use good naming convention and use your version control properly. Be consistent. Not only with the naming convention, but also with how you reference data, both in your database and in your variables. If you reference things and say, I'm going to use Y and N for yes and no, then do it throughout, preferably throughout the database and throughout your variable usage. Um, if you're going to use one and zero or true and false, be consistent, have that be throughout so that you can copy and paste your code from one place to another if need be. I had one developer who worked for me and he, we hired him to work on a payroll module and in one area he had is taxable as a variable and he used Y or N for yes or no, it's taxable. In another section of his code he had the same variable name is taxable and he used one and zero. One for true, zero for false. In a different area of his code, he had is taxable, exact same variable name. He used one for false and two for true. I fired him and I blacklisted him so the company would never hire him again. Be consistent with your use of variables and the values that you are putting into them. From here onward, so whether you're working for yourself or you're working for a company, develop some coding standards. It doesn't matter if you like snake case or camel case, pick one, choose it, make it your religion. Then have the whole company adopt it. All your future programming, all your future coding should use your new code standards. When, you're, when you are told to modify or enhance a older section of code, Take the time to refactor that code using your new coding standards and make it work. There's a nice link in here in the Wikipedia about code refactoring, but basically it means taking old code and 
Don't change any of the functionality except for the minor enhancement that you're working on, but make it more readable, make it more intuitive, make it better coding using coding standards. And if you do that, then over the next couple of years, more and more of your code base will be written with good coding standards that you'll be able to do text searches on and find things much faster. In summary, weeks of coding can save you hours of planning. If you have some forethought to your coding, it will save you a ton of time trying to do enhancements and bug fixes in the future. Good coding standards makes it so you can find code faster, read and understand it easily, and increase reusability. If someone tells you, enhance the code that had that client ID variable defined in a function, you should know immediately exactly what the variable name will be, and a case-sensitive text search should find it in seconds. This document and the Programming Lab's coding standards are available as a free download in the description below. Thank you for watching. If this has been a help, please hit the like button, subscribe for more on the business of programming, and now for the joke of the day. It's amazing how a colon can change the meaning of a sentence. Janet ate her friend's sandwich. Janet ate her friend's colon. Have a great day. Subscribe for more on the business of programming.